I thought I'd start off by just showing you the results at the end. Um, so in short, we've performed the first ever systematic data-driven study of the reorientation histories of the terrestrial planets. And I'll explain what all that means. And what this, what this project has shown us is that all of the terrestrial planets have reoriented fairly substantially over the, the age of the solar system, uh, in some cases well over 10 or 20 degrees of reorientation. And these changes in the spin of a planet can have important implications for volatiles, tectonics, magnetic fields, and all whole sort of other geologic processes. So now to back up a bit, I'm gonna switch off of the planets and explain what polar wanderer is, or reorientation is, using the Earth as my little guinea pig. So there are a couple ways in which a planet can change its spin. Here I'm just showing the Earth spinning around on its axis, and the type of spin change that I think most people are familiar with is what I would term a change in the obliquity of the planet. So here I've taken the Earth and I've taken the spin axis and I've tipped it on its side about 30 or 40 degrees. And when you do this, usually to do this you need to torque the planet, so you have tides from the moon or the sun acting on it and it causes the planet to reorient. But the spin axis, even though it's moved, it still is on the same location on the globe. It's still, in this case, in the Arctic Ocean. What I study in particular is true polar wander, or henceforth reorientation. And when you have polar wander, the spin axis of the planet remains fixed in space. So it's still pointing, say, at Polaris, the North Star. But the planet reorients beneath it. And in this case, I've actually put San Francisco at the North Pole. Um, <laughs> So it'd be a bit colder. So this is a different sort of geometry. It takes some getting used to think about. Um, so why do planets undergo polar wander? The orientation of a planet is not random. It is controlled by the distribution of mass within the planet. And planets, they like to minimize the energy in their spin. And to do that, if you stick random mass anomalies or geologic features across the surface, it will cause the planet to reorient. So for example, if I build a giant supervolcano on LA, that changes the distribution of mass within the planet, and it will cause the planet to tip on its side. So positive mass anomalies, such as this fictional Olympus Mons on LA, reorient towards the equator. In reverse, a negative mass anomaly, so think a big giant topographic depression, so here I've flooded most of North America, uh, they move towards the North Pole. Now, if the reorientation of a planet is controlled by mass, you can also ask, well, mass is moving around. Why doesn't the planet reorient all the time? Why don't we notice this on a day-to-day -day basis? Planets, uh, in order to reorient, you have to move a significant amount of mass. And one of the main forces opposing reorientation is the planet's intrinsic bulge, its equatorial bulge that comes from its rotation and tidal forces. So in order for the planet to reorient, you have to overcome this sort of um, basic characteristic of the planet. Now, true polar wander has been studied extensively for the Earth. This is just one example of showing how, um, going back in time, several hundred millions of years, uh, you can reconstruct the locations of the individual tectonic plates, and you can also figure out that these plates are moving with respect to the sort of average Earth. That's pol true polar wander. True polar wander has been inferred on a number of planets. So here's just a selection of papers from just this year about polar wander on Moon, Mars, and Pluto. And while these are all great studies, and I get to say that because I'm in an author or co-author on two of them. Um, these are usually only looking at one reorientation event. Say, for the moon on the left, um, the reorientation of the moon due to the formation of all the volcanoes on the near side. What does that do? For Mars, the formation of a giant volcano. For Pluto, the formation of this ice-filled basin. So these are all sort of one instant reorientations. And what we would like to do is we'd like to do what we can do on the Earth. We'd like to look at the evolution of the planet's spin through time. So the goal of this research, as I said earlier, 
was to create the first chronology for the evolution of the spin of a planet. So we looked at four planets, well, three planets and a moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, the moon, and Mars. And we picked these four because these are the four objects in the solar system for which we have decently good gravity data. Now, gravity is important because, as I said before, the, the spin of a planet is controlled by the distribution of mass within the planet. And gravity is directly tracing mass. So the plots I were just showing you were topography, so the elevation of the surface. These are plots of the gravity on the surfaces of these planets. And so these, and I've also highlighted the different missions from which this, this data has come from. All of these data sets come from orbital spacecraft, including MESSENGER, Magellan, LRO, GRAIL, and Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And there are a number of differences when you look at these plots. Some of that comes to, from differences of the actual planet. So for example, m the moon is much more cratered um, at a small scale than Venus. So you see all sorts of bumps and wiggles on the moon compared to Venus in this plot. But also some of it comes from the resolution of the data. So the moon has the best gravity field of, best measured gravity field of any object in the universe, as Maria Zuber, the PI of Grail, likes to say. Some of these others, like Mercury, has very low resolution gravity field. And so that, that affects how well we can constrain this chronology. And so how do we actually do this? I'm gonna skip over a lot of this. I have a talk about this tomorrow because it gets into the details of spherical harmonics of gravity. But in short, we've developed a way to look at the gravity signature of an individual geologic feature and fit the data and remove the geologic feature from the planet. So when you do that, you basically are figuring out how that individual geologic feature contributes to the mass of the planet. And by knowing that, you can figure out how the planet reorients in response. So here, I've just taken a very simple model for the Oriental Basin on the moon. And on the left is the observed gravity field, and on the right is one of our examples where we can subtract it off. So if you want to hear the details about that, come to my talk tomorrow. But I'll just jump right into some of the results. So I'll march you through the different planets. We'll start here with the moon, just to get you oriented. Here's a topographic view on the left and a map of the gravity field on the right. And when we run this fitting process, which is fitting real observations of real data, we can remove most of the impact basins on the moon. So this is what the moon would look like if we took off all the big basins. You notice that there's still some small scale structure because we haven't removed every basin and some basins we haven't removed perfectly. So you see some rings of remnants of basins, but the overall signatures of the basins are gone. And this looks very different than this map. Um, there's a lot more basins that you can see here, whereas they've all gone here. So this, what I'm showing here, is basically the original gravity signature of the moon, the original figure of the moon. And for the moon, we call that a fossil figure. You can see it's got one bulge on the far side, and there is a complementary bulge on the near side. That bulge and the equ equatorial bulge come from the tides and the rotation when, this fig when the moon formed. And so by measuring this without the impact basins, it's actually telling us something about the earliest evolution of the moon as it migrated away from the Earth. But getting into polar wander, the single largest reorientation event comes from the single largest impact basin on the moon, South Pole Aiken. So going from no big basins to the largest basin, you can see that the moon reorients. And you form this big basin at the South Pole of the moon. This reorients the moon about 20 degrees. Um, and this is really the biggest thing that happens to the moon in terms of polar wander. All subsequent reorientations are much, much smaller. And so here I'll show a little animation that steps you through all these reorientations. So the first time step that flew by really quick was just South Pole Aiken forming. All these little wobbles are the other basins being added on to the moon in chronologic order. So for the moon and many of these other planetary bodies, we have a, a decently good understanding of the um, relative chronology of impact basins, which impact basins come first. 
On the moon, for some of these, we have direct dates from Apollo samples. So here you can see the moon's wiggling around, uh, but not a whole lot, like it's not flipping on its side. So this is the far side of the moon. It's actually still wobbling. Um, this is the far side of the moon, which I showed first because it shows, oh, it looped. So it shows South Pole Aiken. But we can also look at the near side. So this is the T0, the, the beginning again. And something interesting when you look at this earliest figure is that the, um, this initial tidal bulge happens to be aligned with this region on the moon that we call the Procolarum creep terrain. Basically, these flat regions here are large impact basins that are now filled with uh, volcanic material. So the fact that this is now in this earliest reconstruction is now aligned with this geologic feature might suggest that they're connected. And this is an idea suggested a couple of years back by Ian Garrick Pathel, suggesting that this comes from tidal heating. So the same process that gives you, say, the plumes on Enceladus may be giving us volcanism in the early history of the moon. And so now just looking at this reorientation from the near side, again, that first jump in this, in this animation is from the formation of South Blake in which reorients the moon a lot. And that PKT region moved northward. You can now see the large uh, basins to the north. And so this is, if you could see, if your eyes could see gravity, this is the view that you would see basically from Earth. You'd see the moon wobbling around if you could see gravity and be alive for 4.5 billion years. So moving on to the inner part of the solar system, move to Mercury. So you can see by comparison again that the resolution of this gravity data is not quite as good as the moon. It's much, much lower resolution. The topography is also lower resolution. Here I'm showing laser altimetry data, which isn't exactly the best map for this, but whatever. Um, and, but we can still do this exact same process. The process we've developed is completely generic. And so we can go in and remove all the large impact basins, all the large volcanic lava flows, and see what happens. So the, mess, the gravity field here is a bit messier, but you can remove most of the features. You end up getting something that looks sort of like the moon. It's sort of triaxial. Um, but it's, it has a different origin, which if you want, you can ask me about later. But the, the leading theory for why the moon has, or why Mercury has this triaxial shape right now, I think, is that it comes from the intense heat from being close to the sun and Mercury's unusual spin orbit resonance. Basically, it heats up at, at that red and white region, and that causes the crust to expand a bit. Now we can run through each of the basin forming events. That was Caloris, the largest impact basin, largest confirmed impact basin on Mercury forming. There aren't as many basins or volcanic fields we can see in the gravity field of Mercury, so this animation goes a bit slower. But you can see it's jumping around about as much as the moon was in the previous plot. Next, Mars. So Mars is one of these planets that been, has been looked at quite a bit for reorientation in the past. Um, the biggest likely candidate for that reorientation is going to spin into view in about two seconds, is this large volcanic field known as Tharsis. Uh, so there's three large volcanoes in a row, and then one large one up to the northwest, that's Olympus Mons, tallest mountain in the solar system. You can see that has a whopping gravity signature. And so the idea is that that is probably what's helping to control Mars's orientation. And while that's been looked at in the past, again, the whole point of our research has been trying to put that into context. What are the other impact basins doing? What are the other volcanoes doing? So we can go through and we can do this reorientation, subtract out all the observed gravity features. And again, you're getting the planet to reorient quite a bit. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, again, about 20 degrees. Right there, that's when Tharsis forms in this map, in this chronology. In all of these, I'm showing the present-day topography to give it some structure. But we've moved from Mercury and, and the Moon to worlds that are now controlled, at least in terms of the reorientation, by volcanoes. And that brings us to the last planet that we looked at, which was Venus, which I believe this is the first time anyone has done a data-driven look for polar wanderer of Venus. Um, 
hope that may change depending on which NASA missions get selected in the near future. Um, so again, most of the features that you see in topography and gravity of Venus are volcanic in origin. And we, again, can run through the same process of trying to fit those volcanoes and take them out of the gravity field and see how the planet reorients in response. So here's another little animation of planets bumping around. I was actually kind of surprised that Venus doesn't reorient more. Uh, it ended up reorienting about five or 10 degrees for each large volcano on Venus. Um, there was some expectation that Venus would reorient a lot more because unlike the Moon, Mars, and Mercury, it doesn't have much of a tidal or rotational bulge. So jumping to the results again and some implications, all of the terrestrial plants we've looked at have reoriented at least 10 degrees or more over the last 4.5 billion years. And we've constructed the first preliminary um, chronologies for these reorientations. And I've shown plenty of these little bouncing globes. Another way to look at it that is perhaps more informative, although not as trippy, is are these polar maps. So these are, if you look down and mapped, the location of the North Pole with time. Each point on these maps for these different planets is a pole location. And so the largest one is actually, the largest excursion away from the present day pole, meaning the largest reorientation we find is actually for the moon. Next comes Venus and Mars with its large volcanoes and Mercury doesn't move around too much. So wrapping up some implications, what does this actually do to a planet? Um, how can you test this? One way you can, you can look at it is as you're reorienting the planet, like my example earlier where I put San Francisco at the North Pole, that's gonna change where ice is deposit on the surface of the planet. And this is something that's been looked at a few times before, including a recent paper by Matt Siegler, who's in the room, um, looking at polar deposits on the moon. And the fact that there are polar deposits not quite at the North or South present day poles may suggest past episodes of polar wander. Um, we can test these chronologies by comparing to this and also place age constraints on the ice. So, for example, one of the conclusions of this paper was that this ice is likely very ancient. And we've shown in this work that all the other impact basins don't move the North Pole around too much. So that seems like we haven't immediately discredited this ancient ice hypothesis. Uh, ongoing work is to do this sort of uh, analysis also for Mercury, which also has ice deposits in its north North Pole. Uh, the fact that Mercury does not move around too much may suggest that it that the ice is, could also be long-lived. And then Mars, of course, as you may, if you've gone to any talks this week so far, there's a lot of ice on Mars. There's a lot of evidence for paleo ice or paleo water deposits. And one interesting thing to note is like the moon and Mercury, like the moon, there is some evidence that, of asymmetries in the, in the present day ice deposits. This is a map of hydrogen, which is a proxy for water, and that there is a overabundance of water in one location off the, the present day North Pole, which is in the same direction as our polar wander path. So in the future, we may be able to link and place age constraints on this. Lastly, uh, beyond volatiles, one other thing to talk about is implica implications for the magnetic field to the planets. So usually you assume that the magnetic field and the, spin and the spin of a planet are aligned. And there have been many, many measurements of the magnetic poles for the moon. This is, a, again, a polar plot. The North Pole is right at the center. The equator is at the edge of this plot. And every point in here has been a proposed paleopole for the moon. Um, and to me, it looks like someone took a shotgun to this plot. Um, but now we have a new complementary data set, which will allow us to, to investigate whether these are actually magnetic paleopoles. For example, these paleopoles are substantially far away from our polar wander track. So that may suggest maybe either the magnetic field and the spin pole of the moon are not aligned, which is telling you something about the dynamo, or maybe these are not true paleopoles. Maybe they, the magnetic field comes from something else. So this, my last slide, is just this, the second slide I showed you at the start. Um, we've performed the first data-driven investigation 
of reorientation histories of the terrestrial planets. We have preliminary polar wander paths for all of them. And it looks like polar wander is a ubiquitous process. It happens on all of these objects. And it has implications for many geologic processes that are either past or present on these worlds. So thank you. All right, so now we'll open it up to questions from reporters in the room. Catherine Cornai, Freelance. How did you decide on a threshold of events to look at? Was it a mass cutoff, a size cutoff? How did that work? Uh, so it, it came down to two things. It depended on the planet, actually. So for Mercury, Venus, and Mars, the limiting threshold for the largest feature we looked at, or the smallest feature, I should say, uh, came down to the resolution of the gravity data. So that's, that basically set a limit. We couldn't look at things smaller than the gravity could see. For the moon, the gravity field is almost too high resolution. So you have to truncate it. You have to pick a threshold so that way you can actually do the fitting process. So for three of these guys, for Mercury, Venus, Mars, the limiting factor is the gravity resolution. For the moon, the limiting factor is effectively the computation strength of my computer. So. Hi, I'm Rebecca Boyle, freelance. I've talked to you about this for like four different papers. Um, <laughs> so I have a few questions. Um, I guess the first thing I want to know is what role tectonic activity plays in this, if any, and how that might affect um, what we assume are the big drivers of this from impacts to volcanic activity. Sure. So tectonics come in in a couple different ways. And I listed it here, even though I didn't show a slide about it. But one thing that um, can happen when you reorient a planet is that reorientation can actually build stresses in the crust. So for example, uh, pick any one of these that is currently wiggling around. Um, if, that, if a given geologic feature moves closer to the equator, it experiences a different centrifugal force because it's further away from the spin axis. So if you're moving towards and away from the spin axis, if you're moving latitude at all, then you are changing the forces acting on that, that location. And so polar wander can drive stresses that can lead to fracture patterns on the surface. And that's been looked at for a couple of these, these worlds, Mars in particular. Um, Isamu, my co-author on this, has made maps of the tectonic features on Mars. And for these individual one reorientation events, they don't seem to match. Now that we have more complete chronologies, we can look at the tectonics from each individual reorientation event and see if that can match either the global population of faults or the individual or say local regions. Um, as an example, since I showed some of the work I did on Pluto, that's one of the pieces of evidence that we use to say that Pluto is reoriented is we can predict the tectonic patterns and they match on Pluto. So far, we haven't found such a match on these terrestrial worlds. Um, tectonic processes can also drive reorientation themselves. If they're not the result of the polar wander, they can cause the polar wander. Um, that hasn't been looked at, at least for, uh, for planetary processes. Usually, we think about impact basins and volcanoes because they're the, the big features in gravity. And, but on Venus in particular, there's a, Venus is a geologic mess. So, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the large tectonic features on Venus could also drive reorientation. Okay, I believe we have a question from the web chat. Yes, we have one from Kelly Lee from Sky and Telescope. She wants to know, does your model make assumptions about a given impact's arrival angle? In other words, would a large, highly oblique impact depart enough of a non-radial torque to alter the spin state? Uh, so, uh, what we're looking at here is sort of the, the long-term reorientation. And back when I showed, here, I'm going to go back a few slides. Uh, let's go to here. So when you have an impact, it, it affects all sorts of things. Uh, what 
this question in particular is about is when you have the impact, it can actually change the angular momentum of the planet. It can knock it on its side. It can take the Earth and go from that to this. It can also change the spin rate. These process, we're not looking directly at this. Um, what we're looking at is basically the long-term effect. So this process happens, you knock the, the moon around or you knock Mercury around. Eventually it's gonna settle back to some original or slightly modified angular momentum. It's gonna go back to the way it was. But that spin axis may have changed because you've moved mass around. You've created an impact basin. You've created an ejecta blanket. So basically, if you have an impact, you're going to have these short term, say short term on planetary timescales like tens or hundreds of millions of years process where you may unlock the spin of a planet or you may change the obliquity of a planet. Those, especially for Mercury and the Moon and possibly Venus, are eventually going to go away. And the long term effect is what we're looking at with polar wander. So while this is a chronology, it, it, it likely does not get the instantaneous effects right after impacts. Uh, Josh Roberts, Morrison Planetarium. Wanted to know, one of the things I was really excited about was learning why Venus's rotation is backwards. But I'm worried that might be part of Kelly's question, an instantaneous change. Uh, it's funny how the, the, the simplest observations are still the, the most outstanding <laughs> questions in planetary science. Um, this could play a the this could play a role the reorientation um, because as you're moving mass around you're changing the the, um, the inertia tensor of the planet you're changing the angular momentum of the planet and it's possible that that may give it a different spin but I, I can't see how it would change a prograde rotation into a retrograde rotation. Um, one idea is that Venus's very slow rotation may be due to tidal forces from the sun, much like how the Earth's moon has tidally locked facing the Earth. It's possible that over four and a half billion years, the tidal forces may have enacted a similar process on, on Venus. Um, but I think that still a, it's a great outstanding question that we, we still don't know the answer to. Okay. Uh, Bas den Hond, Cloud Daily Newspaper in the Netherlands. Um, to give a chronology, you, you have to know um, uh, when certain basins or, or volcanoes uh, came and uh, which ones came before other ones. Uh, how do you know? And uh, in connection with, slightly in connection with that, uh, what are the time scales we're talking about? S suppose if, if, if Tarsus popped up suddenly on Mars, how, uh, how soon would uh, a new equilibrium uh, start to exist? And for instance, uh, on Earth, um, is it in the equilibrium now, or is it uh, maybe moving to some equilibrium and will San Francisco end up at the North Pole? Sure. Eventually, anyway. Um, so first, about the, the chronology aspect of these paths. So for this, I trust the geologists. Um, so for many of the largest features on these planets, we have at least a very good understanding of relative ages. So we know that this basin happened before this basin. Uh, or that this volcano formed after this impact structure. So for these, for these chronologies that I've shown, we've relied on a lot of previously established impact basin and geologic chronologies. There are certainly uncertainties in that. And so eventually when I get this published slash defend my PhD, um, there will be uncertainties in those paths. So those paths that I showed, the magnitudes, I don't expect to change it really at all, but the nitty gritty wobbles may go one way or the other. Um, as for the, the time scales for these reorientations, so here I've just shown them sort of going from one equilibrium to the next equilibrium. Typical polar wander time scales are on the order of say 100 million years. Basically, when you form some large impact basin, say, as an example, that knocks the, the planet out of equilibrium, and it wants to lose that extra energy. And usually the way that these plants lose energy is through things like mantle convection, and they damp out the energy that way. And those are usually very slow processes, taking maybe 100 million years. Um, 
As for the Earth, I'm a planetary scientist, so I can pretend to be ignorant about the Earth sometimes. Um, but the Earth, we actually, so I showed a, some other data, uh, geomagnetic reconstructions, but we can actually measure the present day reorientation of the Earth. The Earth's spin is not stagnant. It is currently changing, and we've measured it. Um, there, I'm sure there are talks at this conference about this um, in the geodesy sections. Uh, one recent example of this is actually the, the North Pole is moving, I believe, towards Greenland right now because Greenland is still uh, recovering from the last ice age. The, the, the crust is uplifting beneath Greenland. And, um, so it's a completely different process than these impact basins and volcanoes that I've been talking about for the planets, but it is an active process on Earth, both on short timescales and these planetary timescales. Paul Doherty, the Exploratorium. So you said, you said uh, tidal equatorial bulge is a stabilizing influence, and you have two different uh, scenarios. One for the orientation of the polar axis in space, and two right here is the true polar wander. Which one of those two or both does it stabilize? Um, so having an equatorial bulge acts to, uh, it stabilizes again. I need to make sure I understand the question properly. So having an equatorial bulge makes it harder to reorient something. So if you stick a big, say, the big volcano on Mars, if you put Tharsis on Mars and Mars has a larger bulge, it makes that volcano less capable of reorienting the planet. Um, so it, as far as polar wander, it makes it harder to reorient the planet. Having tidal and equatorial bulges can affect changes in obliquity and the, the other processes that I've glanced over. Um, for example, the precession of a planet is very strongly controlled by the equatorial bulges. Um, so for this work, we've, we're looking at polar wander, in, in which case it's, these bulges stop or act to inhibit reorientation. Does that answer the question? Okay, any other questions from reporters in the room? Any more questions from the web chat? Yes, it does. Um, so if you have a molten interior, a completely molten interior, or at least a layer of liquid, then when you build, say, a volcano on the surface, all that you need, it, all that you have to do to cause polar wander is displace that, displace that outer shell. So you're, you're reducing the amount of mass that you need to overcome to move it. And so that actually makes it easier to cause reorientation on many of the icy satellites. For example, Europa and Enceladus, Pluto, all are thought to have subsurface oceans. And so that makes it easier to reorient these planets, these moons and dwarf planets. Um, so for example, on Europa and I believe Enceladus, there are uh, past studies that have suggested as much as 90 degrees of reorientation, tipping the entire object on its side. And part of that can come from having an ocean that decouples that shell from the interior. So the answer is yes. OK. Ann Rosenthal, Nature Nearby. I'm interested, does this have anything to do with magnetic reversal? Like, could you have it just whip around completely? Um, the, the standard idea is that Probably not. Um, I, I would believe it's much easier to change the processes, the the, the dynamo itself in the in the say the outer core of the Earth, um, and it's been shown through MHT simulations that you can naturally with a naturally forming dynamo you can have magnetic reversals to cause the entire shell of the planet to flip. Well, one is it's hard to flip 180 degrees. It's, it's easier to go 90. So for example, I could show you here. So here, let's say we wanted to put the Arctic at the Antarctic. This got it halfway. So you've you built this big giant volcano in LA, 
that brought, you can imagine, let's say we built that volcano closer to the Arctic. That brought it to the, that would bring it close to the equator. For you to go to the other side, you then need to get rid of that or build some other very, very large negative anomaly, basically this, in, but on the other hemisphere. So you could imagine doing it. Um, it. It would seem very difficult to do geologically. And I suspect that it's, it's much more, it's much easier on, to do it just from magnetic field reversals in the core. Sure. OK, any other questions from reporters in the room? I just have one more really bad question, but I'm trying to find an analogy for this. And one thing I wrote at one point, which might be totally wrong, is that if your planet is a peach, you hold the peach <laughs> and the pit and the flesh stay where they are, but you slip the skin around. Is that basically what this is like? Uh, so that that's so when you have yes and no. <laughs> So this is sort of related to that having the molten layer on the inside. When you have polar wander, you, like for the Earth in this ridiculous case, you're reorienting the entire solid part of the outer solid part of the planet, which for the Earth includes the crust and the mantle. And so it would, that analogy could be correct if the peach skin was much of the peach. Um, that, that analogy would be really good for these icy satellites where it's really most likely the crust, this thin outer layer, reorienting with respect to the interior. But yeah, in terms of the, the process, I, yeah, that could, that could work as an analogy. It's hard to think of analogies for this. Josh Roberts, Morrison Planetarium. Uh, I noticed that your animation cuts off the exact moment that Los Angeles reaches the North Pole. Is there any degree of overshoot and stabilization? Um, so, yes. Um, so this is, I have to be careful with using this animation as an example, because really, let's say we are building this big giant basin Again, the polar wander processes are extremely slow, and here I'm just showing it moving instantaneously. Um, it could overshoot, but it depends on the um, the exact, effectively the exact gravity anomaly of that basin and how it evolves with time. Um, so, for this case, it would be hard for this to overshoot because. The minimum energy place to put this negative mass anomaly is right at the pole. For it to overshoot, it would have to become a positive mass anomaly. So in this particular case, I can't really see it overshooting. Um, for a, a positive mass anomaly, again, for it to overshoot in this fashion, the gravity anomaly would have to be changing with time to do this. So, which I mean, on geologic time scales, these things certainly do happen. And that was a big part of the paper with Matt Siegler, which I have oops, this graphic for, is we were looking at the reorientation of the moon due to basically the formation of a, of a mantle plume, effectively, beneath all the near side. And so this mantle plume is changing gravity anomaly with time. And so you can have, say, the pole, the pole will move with time, and it can overshoot deposits. It can move around. And, it can get quite complicated. Yeah. OK, any other questions? Anything on the web chat? All right, that concludes it. Um, thanks, guys. We'll reconvene at 2.30 um, to discuss the New England, uh, sorry, New Zealand earthquake. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.